Well, he said I was to be the executioner, so I come all fixed. Think I don't know my business, huh? <laughs> Two cowboys hit up the local saloon and stumble across a vicious lynch mob. But could it be mistaken identity? I remember seeing this film years ago on Turner Classics in Ireland. This film always stuck with me. And when it came around to watching it this time, one thing that I was really shocked by is Henry Fonda is an absolute baby in this film. So young. And the other interesting thing was seeing him play in a hothead character. Because, you know, he's getting into fights mm. straight away in the bar. And he always seems like he's like two seconds away from losing his shit at any point. Which is not really what I associate with Henry Fonda ever in his films. Like, his characters are always even killed. Quite a calming presence usually in a film he is. I must admit, it's a bit of a sacrilegious thing for me to say. When I see, you know, old black and white films from this time, I'm kind of put off from it and I don't know why. You know, there's other ones which I will watch religiously. It's A Wonderful Life is mm. one of them, you know. How can I explain it? It's kind of like the way it's dubbed. No, Sheriff! <laughs> so it's the, the very stage feel of acting. You, you know when you like watch an old play or something or watch a play where behind it's like the sets and they wheel them off. It's kind of like that. They walk in like it's the theatre. And it's just very unnaturalistic theatrical style of acting, which does dominate the 40s and 50s. And it only really changed up until the 60s in filmmaking. I feel bad because I feel like by being snobbish about black and white mm. and this era, I've cut off so many good films that I could have mm. watched. So, I, you know, I'm really grateful that, that you did choose this. I would only seek out older films or black and white films or films from the 40s, 30s, 50s, whatever, if you really want it. Because, you know, what's the point? Like, ultimately, mm -hmm. you're doing it for yourself. But if you found, like, you like this film today that we're going to review, you like It's a Wonderful Life or other films you have seen, you know, the handful of ones you have seen from that era, definitely seek out more because you're literally missing out on 30-40% of the amazing films that have ever been made. It's easier for me because I really, really love these sort of films. I love the stagey theatrical acting. I love the goofy horse shit and just the completely phony interactions people have, you know, where like mum and dad are all happy together mm. and little Jimmy comes down and he wants to go play sticks outside with his friends. Yeah. So they're like, okay, be in for dinner and everything's all lovely and nice all the time. And black people don't exist and whatever. You know what I mean? Or you just see yeah. them in the background as extras. You know, it's horseshit, but I just love it for that. Do you know what I mean? If you, there's nothing wrong with not liking certain types of films. So Henry Fonda walks into the bar. He's seemingly looking for his... Is it his girlfriend? Like, I was confused. I'm guessing start. a woman. It's probably like, knowing those days, it's probably a woman that he met for like three days and then they agreed to marry. And he's gone off, I don't know, I think, you know, he's gone off to make his fortune or the mm. war or whatever the hell's going on. But he's gone off for a while. Doesn't say how long, but it sounds like it's more than a week. And she was supposed to be waiting for him. And he comes back into the bar and he seems very upset straight away upon learning that she hasn't hung around waiting for him. She's gone. Seemingly left the town. She went to Frisco, the first stage out this spring. That's a lie. She said she'd wait. That's a fact. What a town. You know, all the married women in town were worried about this beautiful unmarried woman just existing in town, I guess. Like, they were also worried, like, if she's around, everyone's going to fuck her. See, if a wedding ring really does make a difference. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm sure yeah, people yeah. were fucking whoever they wanted back in the day. It's really well easy, like, you know. Yeah. There's no records of anything. Just fuck <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone seem, people seem to leave for six months at a time, constantly as well, so. And, and there's been so many affairs happening. What I've noticed about this film, the love interests are always called, like, Rose or something. Yeah. It's always like, Rose ain't here no more. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. fuck's sake, like, is that the best? name they had like but yeah he, she, she's gone straight away the bartender of the place seems to be a mug he's just there trying to wind henry fonda up i think to get him to start mm. a fight he is easy to wind up it's like you when you go to the oh, wishing yeah, well yeah 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 people right. will just wind you up about football because they like, know it's just, they just <laughs> turn it and then yeah. just watch you start like flailing your arms yeah. and control it. <laughs> classic western philosophy on life is dumb little moment where Henry Fonda gets wound up by this other guy and starts a fight, instantly knocked out, 
by the bartender with a bottle. They're just kind of laughing about it, like, ah, you know him, he just, he'll be fine when he wakes up. Once He doesn't care if he loses a fight. As long as he's had a fight, he's good to go, like, he's happy. And then he wakes up, what happened? Like, he hit me yeah, with a bottle? Yeah. And his friend's going, oh, you should have seen what you did to him, though. Saving his embarrassment a little bit. But what makes me laugh about these western towns, yeah, there's always, like, only one sheriff police officer. And in yeah. all these films, he's always away on business. That's not how you run as a society. Imagine us, with, like, check if the police officer's there. Yeah. Check if the one guy's there. Yeah, imagine there. you call, like, 911, <laughs> someone's killing me. You just it's really... like, no, he's not here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, who's he's, not here? He's the got, police. He's gone for lunch. <laughs> kind of like the Wicker Man, where there's, like, one mm. police officer. Officer on the well, island. Not even a policeman. The thing is, though, you think that is the population of the town. Mm-hmm. How many police can you have? Even probably having one sheriff for the amount of people in that town is probably way more per head of population than we have police. Yeah, and I guess no one wants to take the job because at the end of the day, everyone's like, the sheriff's never there, number one, which he's got to travel to all these different places on horseback, Mm. you know. Everyone's got guns and doesn't care about, like, you know, life back then was just, if we know anything about Westerns, Mm. you're going to get shot. It's like GTA, any, like, any person can get shot at any moment. Massive disagree, though. I would love to be the sheriff. Really? Yeah, you're the fucking king like everyone has to do what you say you're basically the president of the world you live in because back then people didn't really leave the town like they would talk about going to the next town over like well we'll never see you again so goodbye (laughs) yeah so your known universe is this little town and then you're like the person everyone looks up to you're the guy who can just be like jimmy broke into that barn kill him yeah (laughs) like execute him like you want to be the sheriff the judge or the local businessman who owns all the businesses. The barman would be a pretty good one because everyone really the likes bar- the barman. Yeah, the barman would be cool because yeah. you're chatting to everyone. Yeah. You, you kind of know everyone in town. People probably wouldn't... You, you probably know a lot of shit on people because everyone always talks or, to the barman. Or there's only ever one trained doctor. Yeah. And that would be a pretty good one because at the end of the day, you would you would get dough. You're the only one that knows how to do it. And you'll be like, well, you're dying so I can charge you whatever you want to yeah. charge so that would be pretty good and usually they, they would also be the vet or maybe they <laughs> oh, just yeah. maybe they just are a vet but they're also the doctor yeah, yeah. there's no doctor so anyway henry fonda's pissed obviously you know he's came back to find his missus and his missus is gone everyone's making fun of him he's already lost a fight so he's obviously livid and he pretty much stays pissed off for the rest of the film but then they see a bunch of people kind of like running in like running about town and running into the saloon and gathering about so they go in to check it out And they discover supposedly a local who owns a ranch nearby has been murdered and had a bunch of cattle stolen. And he sounds like he's a pretty sick guy. Everyone seems to love him. No one has a bad word to say about him. Seems like he's a very popular, like, beloved figure in this town. They've been working together ever since they were kids. All the way from the panhandle to Jackson's Hole. Sure, I knew him. Short, dark Irishman. Didn't say very much. Like to sing a lot. He's the most that? God-fearing Irish man I know. <laughs> okay. That's what they say. His, name, know, his name's like King Glazy or something. Oh, fuck really? It. Yeah, King Glazy. That's a fucking cool name. Yeah, I know. King Glazy? Know. Yeah, we'll have to check it out. Who was it they got? Kincaid. Kincaid. Farley's buddy? You know, him being dead, he seems, as you said, dead and a very popular figure. Obviously, in these western towns, the first thing they want to do, instead of seeking the correct avenues, like the way that western justice works is shoot first, ask questions later, get a posse together, get a lynch mob, and we're going to go and hang these people. You'll get like two, you'll get like one or two who will be like the actual pussies of the town who will be like, no, we need to speak to the judge or, or wait for the sheriff. Down in Texas, where I come from, we just go out and get a man and straight. Him up. That's right. I say stretch him. Think just a rustler we're after. It's a murderer. Larry Kincaid, one of the finest, most God-fearing men that ever lived, is lying out there right now with a bullet hole in his head. If you let this go by, there won't be nothing safe around here. Our cattle, our homes, not even our women folks. I'm with you, Farnley. I'm going to get me a gun and some rope, and I'll be right back. And it's pretty funny because you say Western, because obviously it is a Western trope and you see it in Western. Yeah. But really, it's just human. Because you look at any place that ain't exactly a civilized modern metropolis yet. And that is how they do shit. And that is how shit's been done all throughout time. Partly because, you know, it's human nature and partly also because it's just a logistical thing. It's kind of like how in parts of Ireland, where I'm from, you know, if it's really remote, they just sort of allow drink driving. Not the <laughs> law. The law is still against drink driving, but they there's kind of a 
the authorities to an extent turn a blind eye because what's everyone gonna, like what is it's just no one gonna socialize ever again yeah you're right and it's the same thing you're where right. letter of the law in the united states they know you're not really supposed to go and lynch people but what the fuck like we're in the remote west what are we supposed to do we got to do something you know what i mean so there's yeah, a yeah, yeah. there's a kind of like a bending of the laws that they, is understood but you know, if you've ever seen one of those horrific videos from Nigeria where they, you know, yeah. a man stole a boot, so we setting him on fire in public, which is their version of lynching. It kind of hammers home of like, wow, that is really, really fucked up. And it taps into something like the actual act is fucked up. You know, seeing it is fucked up, but it taps into a part of human psychology. That's really interesting. Kind of reminds me of, you know, we had a friend pass away and obviously it was a big moment in, you know, the funeral and the build up to it and everything. And a lot of people loved him. So a lot of people were very attached to it. But also there was a lot of people that kind of shouldn't really, I, I shouldn't say shouldn't have been that upset. But it felt like they weren't as in, they were, they were nearly like an emotional leech sucking onto the overall event. And it's kind yeah, of like yeah, how, I get, I get you, you know, if someone's already sad and they sing sadness actually happening, they kind of latch onto it in a weird way. And I liken mm. that to this in how you could tell a lot of these characters didn't give a fuck about the guy that got killed. Didn't give a fuck if these people were the real perpetrators. They were excited to kill someone without getting in trouble for it. But also, maybe maybe not as clear-cut as that. Maybe not even knowing in their heads that they just wanted to kill someone. But maybe getting excited about the opportunity to actually exercise some of like, the anger and violence inside them out in the real world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, actually, as well, it was a lot of boredom. Oh, you better come along, Sparks. Ain't every day we have a hanging in a town of dead edition. There is actually one black guy in this film who's like the preacher, it seems. Was he black? I think he was black, yeah. Uh, the guy singing. And he says, like, are you coming along, preacher? And the preacher's like, no, I, you know, I'm a man of faith. I don't really want to, like, be witnessing the hanging. And the fat, bumbling character says, oh, along the lines of, it's so boring here, you hardly ever get to see a hanging. I would come if I was you. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's, you know, and it's that whole pack mentality it's like dogs, isn't it? The alpha males are the alpha males. The others will just fall in line. Mm. The alpha male, it's like anything, work, like you need to assert your dominance. Like the, the dominant ones will just be like, this is what we're doing. And the weaker ones will just follow in line. Like they'll mm. probably have their second thoughts of like, I don't think this is right, but they'll be too afraid to like speak up. So they just end up going along with the crowd. Mm. It's a great peer pressure. Yeah. You know, I've been peer pressured to smoke, but I've never been peer pressured to hang someone. I probably would try and say something i mean <laughs> if you saw it it probably would be pretty entertaining on some level being a part of it i mean as horrific as that sounds it seems like it's pretty hardwired into human psychology and if you look pretty much all of entertainment history until very recently is to do with violence you yeah, know you're right all the way from gladiators like part of the reason why they ended public hangings in the uk and other places is because they realized not only was it not a deterrent it used to sometimes break out into riots and people fucking loved it like people would turn up in droves to see a hanging or an execution they fucking loved it and you go all the way back to eight you know three thousand years ago what are they doing they're doing gladiators and yeah. shit like it's always been violence and it's only very very recently it's become you know more like catching a ball and shit but even then what's some of the bits people get most excited about is aggressive violent parts as you know when you're well i don't drive but you know <laughs> when I'm in the car and there'll be traffic on both sides, even though you're in the opposite side to the axe. And there'll be traffic in your side because everyone is stopping to be like, oh, someone's had a crash there. There's a mm. dead body there actually in the road. Like it's called morbid curiosity. And that is just a human thing. Do you know what 100%. I mean? 100%. Yeah. And Henry Fonda himself witnessed a lynching when he was a child. Really? And he always described it like it really had a profound effect on him. He was firstly obviously disturbed by seeing a man die. But what disturbed him much more was the behaviour of everyone around it. How excited and gleeful everyone got. Clearly, whether they showed that directly or not, you know, they had the facade of, oh, this is just something that needs to be done, you know, it's justice. What about fucking Timmy or... But he said, like, you could just see, they could not wait. They were so happy they had the opportunity to all get together and fucking kill this guy. So, Henry Fonda's character has kind of the same sentiment. There's nothing to say that the lynch mob are out of control yet or in the wrong. 
but he can just feel it. He, he can just sense the characters that make up the mob and the things they're saying and the attitude they're already taking. He's just like, ah, the, ah, I have a bad feeling about this. And even though I get the feeling he's lived in the town, but he's not real local, he's not considered a local or a part of the town anyway. So it's not really considered his business, but he just wants to, he wants to go with the mob and see how things go and just maybe not get involved just yet, but be a part of it. And his friend's a bit like, come on, man, let's fucking leave. It's not our business, but they end up both heading with him. And we get some nice, probably done by the second unit director, big wide shots of them out in the West riding all yeah. their horses. And there's a kind of, you know, there's a couple of scenes of kind of like building up to finding the lads who've committed this murder. Henry Fonda's character comes across, you know, his old girlfriend and she's now with this sort of fancy businessman. Chicago hotshot. I might start advocating for a shorter, bite-sized, one-hour, 15-minute story films. Because, you know, even though, as you said, it had the bits in the camp where they'd be, like, right, lighting a cigarette, and it'd be like, that. I, I liked it because think of all the films that you've seen, if you really analyse them, like, you'd be like, the only reason you're bringing up that, that one scene is because there was so little scenes overall. You're like, it doesn't make any sense of it being here. Imagine all the three-hour, half films you've seen it and if you look back at you be like what was the point of that yeah if you why did i watch robert de niro visit the dentist <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like, do you know what I, do you know what i mean it doesn't impact anything like and going on to this scene i don't know i guess maybe the director's thought processes are oh, it will be good for the audience to run into rose or whatever her name is just to show like she's a young buck and she's all charismatic and all the men fancy her the husband saying like basically keep off my property in no uncertain he was term. pretty nice about it though as well yeah he was he, he was, was kind of like he was like hey listen you know i get it you used to go out of her now i'm married to her give us a bit of space will you because she might have still sort of some feelings for you but you know after a while if she wants to be your friend and you're a friend of mine come on over but his whole monologue was like quite sexist of like basically like i need a few days to break her in <laughs> yeah and then well he's basically <laughs> saying yeah. hey can you like i like in those days i they, they probably a lot of the time genuinely didn't fuck until they were married yeah you're right so he's you're right like, you're right you're right, you're can you right. let me fuck my wife yeah. a couple of days you're, you're right I'll, like he, he might have been a virgin all his life waiting to fuck but he's in... like can you like give it five and henry fonder as well imagine you're like oh, this is my ex yeah he's henry fonder of those beautiful eyes they go off in, into the distance and we never see him once again like mm. i don't like my opinions on it declan was it was really pointless unless they wanted to just quickly introduce us to the girl but it doesn't feed into the film at all so anyway they're on the trail of the three supposed murderers and eventually they track them down and they sneak up on them while they're sleeping and we're introduced to them one by one and it's kind of a weird trio one seems to be like this nice quite sensitive curly haired little fella the other is this Mexican who seemingly doesn't speak any English and the other is this old feeble dementia patient yeah he's a Mexican dressed as the most Mexican American I've ever seen <laughs> like it's black and white but I'm pretty sure it's a purple <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with like one of those belts with like a skull and it like do you know what i mean it's like flicking at night if and down like you know they grab onto him and they said you're gonna get hanged this film did a very good job of making me feel empathetic to him because like the seemingly nice sensitive ones like we haven't done anything the old fucking dementia patient started to grass up the mexican <laughs> show yeah, it, was like, it was like he was being so racist he was like Mexican did it. Uh, he told me so. Uh, no. Uh, I saw him do it. Juan couldn't have done anything. I was with him all the time. Uh, uh, yes, he did, Mr. Martin. He was asleep and he didn't mean to tell me. And, I, and the Mexican didn't even protest because yeah. he was trying to keep up the premise of I don't speak English, let me try and get mm. away with this. But straight away I felt sorry for him and I started trying to work out are these guys guilty? Are they not? Yeah, so I feel especially bad for the curly-haired guy. No, the other guy apparently doesn't speak English. We find out later he does. Mm. His other person he's with is completely delusional and trying to throw the Mexican guy under the bus. And he's in the middle trying to plead their case. And it's funny because it's that thing where, you know when you see stuff in court where someone's getting sentenced for murder and they're denying it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. as they're going down, say the sentence has been handed out, they've got 40 years or whatever, and the judge is like, and you've still shown no remorse. Yeah, 
And it's like, how am I supposed to show remorse when I still, I'm claiming I didn't do it? From my point of view, I didn't do it. And it's that same thing where they're like, lynching for what? And they're like, murder. And it's like, didn't murder anyone. And it's like, oh my God, and you won't even admit it. At least if you yeah. admit you murdered him, you know, maybe we'd go easy on you, but you won't even admit it. So now we're going to fucking hang you. And it's like, what are you supposed to do? Well, even in this godforsaken country, I've got a right to a trial. You're getting a trial that 28 are the only kind of judges, murderers and rustlers get in what you call this godforsaken country. So far, the jury don't like your story. Well, I'm not going to say another word without a proper hearing. Suit yourself, son. But this is all the hearing you're likely to get, short of the last judgment. And basically, the lynch mob have justification to hang him because... And this is justice back in the West. Imagine if this was in real life, like you just stole something. Basically, they have rights to hang him because he doesn't have a receipt. Have you a bill of sale for those cattle? Well, no, I haven't. But Mr. Kincaid said it'd be all right. I couldn't find him at the ranch house. He was out on the range. He didn't have a bill of sale with him. So they asked one of his friends, have you ever known King Clasi? <laughs> that's his actual name. name. Have you ever known Clasi to uh, not write a receipt? Dill. And he's like, well, no, but then again, I don't you know, I don't keep track of everything yeah. he does. You know, he might have done. So they're like, ah, that's good enough then. We'll, you know, we're still hanging him. And they're going back and forth and you start to see a rift in the group. You start to see a divide between those who are for the hanging and those who aren't. And eventually this turns into an actual divide where they line up on one side or the other just to sort of have a vote and i think it's seven to about 30 yeah i think like the nice kind of like black uh reverend fave guy mm. like just walks over by himself and there's this really like fat annoying like rosie o'donnell one woman like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like, like running, about running about doing bare shit and i'm like what is your problem pretty cool role for a woman back <laughs> yeah, then though. yeah yeah one more word out of you, Smith, and I'll have you up for impeding the course of justice. Judge, you can't impede, but don't move anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Jenny Greer, a woman, to lend yourself to this. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, it's really annoying because... She is a munter. Is, yeah, it's actually Kim Clarty's fault for not writing the receipt. The more you think about it, mm. it's like, if this happened to me, I'd just like either call up Watchdog, you know, when they like that guy like rides around on his bike, like mm. trying to sort out business disputes. Or that like small bald midget guy who runs about to the cowboy builders. <laughs> is he a midget? I don't know. He's bare small. Dominic Littlewood. He's like... No, he's like, he's in the recording room and he's like... <laughs> I've heard enough. Let's go in there. Yeah, yeah. I walk in. And then they're front. going into Asda and he's like, Mr. Mr. And he's like, their face. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but anyway. The thing is, you say, should have wrote the receipt, but we don't know. Like, that's the position everyone's in where they don't know if they've murdered him or not. Like, to be honest, they don't have any kind of evidence. I get the fact that, okay, this guy's claiming that he sold him to him. I get that. Okay. There's a real world connection to him. But even still, this is the thing that got me. The curly head guy, He's pleading his case and not believing him. So he's like, okay, you don't believe me. Just wait five minutes. Like, yeah. can't you just wait and go find out? But everyone's too riled up. Because, you know, even the deputy, because that's quite a big point in the storyline, the fact that the sheriff's away. I haven't heard that sheriff's work in it. Well, that's no posse. That's a lawless lynching mob. It'll be a posse when I get there. I'm going to deputize them all proper. But you can't do that. Risley's the only one empowered to deputize. There's an ex-Civil War guy there. Oh, he's a Who's wanker. kind of... He, I guess he's not officially... He's not like the judge who comes along as well. Or the sheriff or the deputy. But he's kind of unofficially an authority in town. You know, people look up to him and respect him. This is essentially a courtroom drama set in the Old West. Yeah. yeah. And kind of like 12 Angry Men. Henry Fonda would also star in years later. Another great film. People have their own reasons and baggage for why they believe what they believe. Or why they're going in a certain direction right off the bat that has nothing to do with the person on trial in either films and this guy you know he's the father of a young son who you know he seems like a nice guy but you know he's a sensitive guy he's a good person but he's not exactly tough he's a bit of a pussy he nearly faints at the sight of blood at one point because the mexican guy you know he, he has to cut out a bullet out of someone's leg he's very polite but has no stomach for blood eh 
because he, yeah. he tries to run off. That's when it reveals that he can speak and he is actually an outlaw, which again makes makes the makes case, their case convinces worse. Yeah, yeah. It, the case in their own mind. He's got, convinces them even more. He's also they find they search up the Mexican. And, and he's got King Clarsy's gun. Yes, which he claims he finds. Which, so again, he like, finds, yeah. he's getting supposedly more evidence towards it, but it's still just like, like just wait two minutes. Mm. Like, you're, what is the sell-by date on this? Like, why do you have to hang him tonight? To be fair, a lot of people are genuinely really upset that their friend has supposedly been killed. But, you know, the dad's a war veteran and the son is a bit meek. If he was born nowadays, he'd probably move to Seattle and become an artist. You know, he's just a creative yeah. type. He's not like that. And his dad just sees him as a massive pussy. And he, he wants him to be in a hanging. He wants him to see death. He wants him to do some man shit as he sees it in his eyes. And that is his real reasoning. Like, he's not even really thinking about it anymore so much about whether these guys might have done it or not. He's more just going to make sure my son's one of the ones that you know puts him on the rope mm, and does mm, the hanging. And, mm. and his son ends up being one of the people that goes to the other side during the divide where he doesn't believe, he's like, he doesn't believe these men did it. Or even if they might have done it, this isn't right. Like, this isn't the way to go about it. It's exploring all these little different avenues of how people get into these situations. Situation. Let's call off this party. Take it back to judge like Davies wants. This is only slightly any of your business, my friend. Remember that? Hanging's any man's business that's around. If your stomach for justice is cooling, Carter, I advise you to leave now before we proceed any further. By that vote, they just decide to hang him. It's like, how can you, by walking across a piece of ground decide if someone lives or dies that's how fragile mm. and, and and weak this is like they have no accountability of people's lives like they just want to do what they want to do and it's just it's just sad really so then the little curly haired fella asks well at least let me write a letter mm. to my wife so he writes this letter and he spends a long time on it and everyone's kind of like chilling they take the handcuffs off the guys for a while and you know they're just knocking about the mexican's doing his thing the old man's just sitting there all confused and he um, should have just been hanged he's he just sees his point. Like, they should have looked at him like mumbling about and just been like, fucking put him first. And the curly head guy was even saying, oh, at least let him go. What? Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Are you really yeah. going to hang this poor demented old guy? But maybe they think it's a trick. Maybe they think he's acting. Maybe they don't care. Yeah. Anyway, so he writes this letter. Not the Reverend, but there's another man in town who's basically the real voice of reason from the start. Even before it's popular or got out of hand, he's really trying to keep things under control. Just convince people, look, let's just chill. Like, I'm not even saying they didn't do it. Like, Let's just relax. The curly head guy gives the letter to him and says, please make sure you get this to my wife. He ends up reading it. And then yeah. he starts going around to everyone else trying to convince them to read it. Because he's saying, you know, if you read this letter, you will believe this guy is innocent. But when he discovers he's showing the letter around to everyone, he's devastated. And he, he's like, I don't even want you to give that letter to my wife now. Because it's, it's, it's stained now. It's ruined. Like, I can't, that letter wasn't meant for everyone else. Yeah, I see his reason of trying to save pussy curly hair's life. But I think that's a bit out of order to put opening, like, his last letter to his wife. That is bang out. The sentiment of it, yeah. absolutely. But it wasn't morbid curiosity. He read it and he was like, people need to read this because it maybe it will turn their minds. Because he also knows, like, everyone's going by emotion here. They're not going by logic. Or most people are going by emotion. They're not going by logic. So let's try and get some emotion going in the other direction. So yeah, yeah. smart. The posse between them decides to wait for one more night to see if the sheriff will bowl up. So they give him a, a stay of execution. That night passes, letters are written. It must have been difficult for the free man. Kind of like your last day on death row. Mm. You know your execution is tomorrow. Imagine how bad you must feel. Like yeah, you're, and you're hanging out with a bunch of dicks yeah, and being mean you're to you. sitting like laying awake. You can't sleep because you know tomorrow is judgment day. And you're just thinking like, especially if you're like on death row in America, you might have thoughts of, oh, maybe I'll be safe. At the last you get second. that call from the governor. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. But it never happens. And, you know, it gets to the morning and it seems like they don't even give it any time. Straight away, as soon as the sun comes up, yep, yeah, it's time. Like, do you know what I mean? They get the ropes ready. They're all, like, jeering and, like, clapping and happy. And, you know, they, and they just hang them. string them up and hang them. They hit the, the horse. It bolts. And, you know, I think they have the mercy to shoot them with a rifle, at least, instead of letting them hang. Like, they do do that, but... I think hanging would probably be better. Unless it's shooting... shot straight in the head, mate. Yeah, I suppose, but I don't know. I feel like shooting in the head would be scary and more horrible. 
Like, just getting your neck broken in one is pretty good. I think the worst would be hanging because you're suffocating. No, no, hanging you, your neck your, your neck snaps because, yeah, um, lethal injection would be terrible. That looks very painful. Because apparently the chemicals are fucked. Um, do you know what's funny about that? That is such a true thing. Like What you bring up there is that they do it lethal injection rather than shooting someone in the head because of the optics of it and because it will make us feel better about it. But it'd be way better to shoot them in the head for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, firing squad will be pretty hard as well because you just have to like stand there and be like, mm. they're like, close it's your, the same thing, isn't close it? your eyes. You know what they should do? They should just say, at some point in the next six years, we're just going to pop you in the head with a, from a sniper. Yeah, yeah. So just go, actually, that'd probably be horrendous. Because you you're just... like, all of a but, sudden, you'd be looking around. Like... But you do that for like two weeks and then you just start walking around or whatever. But yeah, so they hang the three men and they head off back into town and almost immediately come across the sheriff saying, what, what's this about a lynch mob, blah, blah, blah. And they're saying, oh no, don't worry, sheriff. We got the three guys. We got them, they're dead. And the sheriff's like, he's not dead. What are you talking about? And yeah. so you find out, I guess it was like rumors or Chinese whispers, but he wasn't even dead the whole time. So not only did these guys not murder him, no one murdered him. I think he's injured and was in the hospital next town over. Maybe they even did steal the cow because they did seem a bit screwy why is he hanging around with this mexican outlaw <laughs> yeah exactly you know what's going on they just seemed like an odd bunch but whatever he, they didn't murder him anyway so again it's like you know what the fuck and sheriff asked a little melvin grass guy who yeah, did this and he just weasel, grasses the little weasel up. yeah he says not everyone but these people and then they get back to the town i guess the people innocent you know just get away with it even though they were part of the posse they tried to save their lives mm. no one's actually in trouble yet everyone's just walking about civil war guy gets back to his house yeah. he locks him out i guess because you know he's ashamed of his son because he didn't go along with the killing even though he was right yeah he has a great little moment where he's shouting through the door at his dad i could have stopped you with a gun just as any other animal can be stopped from killing but i couldn't do it because i'm a coward <laughs> aren't you glad you made me go father weren't you proud of me how does it feel to have begun a weakling major tetley does it make you afraid that there may be some weakness in you, too, that other men might discover and whisper about? Open the door, Major. I want to see your face. I want to know how you feel now. You listen to him as he's shouting through the door, and then he casually bowls into his room and shoots himself. Blows his brains out. That little mini subplot was always the thing that stuck with me the most when I watched the film as a kid. So, fat Civil War veteran is the most coward of all. Like, No, he's definitely... like His son is a massive pussy compared with him. Yeah, he, I know. I, I believe he's a Civil War veteran, but you're right in a way because he couldn't he couldn't face himself. We couldn't handle the reality. Yeah, but he that. would have got... He was one... He was, if not the main instigator of all of this, by the way. Mm. And he would have hopefully been hanged himself for wronging, mm. for wronging them. So, all in all, it's like fucking Jeffrey Epstein or, you know, Harold Shipman when they get caught. Instead of, like, facing the justice because they're such egomaniacs, they decide to hang themselves and kill themselves instead. I mean, Jeffrey Epstein definitely didn't hang himself. Yeah, but yeah, I agree with the sense. Harold Shipman then. So yeah, so Henry Fonda and his friend goes back to the saloon. Reconvene in the bar. He reads the letter out loud and it's this beautiful moment where, you know, you're hearing the words of the letter. You're seeing everyone go around the room and look at their faces and everyone's just like, oh damn, we fucked up badly, man. There can't be any such thing as civilization unless people have a conscience. Because if people touch God anywhere, where is it except through their conscience? And what is anybody's conscience except a little piece of the conscience of all men that ever lived? I guess that's all I've got to say except kiss the babies for me and God bless you. Your husband, Donald. You know, it's an emotional letter to his wife, but it's also a beautiful message wrapped up in it. Henry Fonda bowls outside to his horse and his friend runs after him like, where are you going? Where are we going? He said he wanted his wife to get this letter, didn't he? He said there was nobody looking after the kids, didn't he? And you just know, like, they're going to go off, they're going to get the letter to him, they're going to sort her out, however it is, you know, fucking marry her or provide for her, whatever you do in those days, but, like, you know that family's fucked, but they're going to be okay. 
and it mirrors the opening shot of the film as they ride off out of town. I highly recommend this. You know, I, I woke up this morning and just banged this film out instantly. Mm. I knew it was one hour 15. I was like, let me get up early, bang this film out before work. And, you know, it's put me in a reflective mood all day because within that one hour 15 minutes, it just shows, like, every people's different judgment. So quick to judge and ha- opinionated. And, and some people want to say people and some people, as Alfred says in... Batman Begins, some people just want to watch the world burn, Mr. Mm. Wayne, you know. So it's just a fantastic film, like great acting. And it was frankly refreshing to see a black and white film, to see a film like this that is theatrical, as we discussed earlier, compared to the over-budgeted, fine tooth comb studio films, you know. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, also, I'd like to introduce you to more of these earlier westerns yeah. that weren't all about the shootouts. More kind of like, inter- is they're more kind of like the kind of old, samurai sort of films you'd see where you know they're used more as a vehicle for exploring ideas about life and you know this is an example of that where they were restrained they weren't about action it simplified life in a way where you could distill it down to something that you could use to communicate ideas and stuff about people and about life and about human nature seeing henry fonda in a really early role it seems like films from this era you could just knock out like 40 of them a year yeah yeah. do you know what i mean like or a week (laughs) or a week like i'm pretty sure this film used like what four sets yeah no one set inside the saloon, one set outside the saloon, the, the set the around camp, the campfire. Yeah. So three. Yeah, and then a couple it. of exterior Oh, shots. maybe, maybe like the inside of the houses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay, about yeah. four or five. But yeah. But it's mad. But yeah, do you recommend it? I highly recommend it. You know, yeah, I definitely recommend this film. It is, like we said, very simple, very restrained, very short. Nearly feels like an hour long episode. TV like yeah. if you cut out some of the filler yeah. you could fit it into like probably 45 minutes but watch it in its entirety because it's beautiful it's early Henry Fonda early filmmaking early westerns and a little slice of like a bygone era of filmmaking that you'll never get again they'll never make films like this again so easy recommendation for the Oxbow incident where are we going he said he wanted his wife to get this letter didn't he said there was nobody to look after the kids didn't he 